Good morning. It is good to be here this morning after a, a long weekend, supposedly, as you have celebrated our Independence Day and as we have uh, uh, partaken in, in, in maybe not a normal one as we normally think about it, but we have celebrated and we've all celebrated in our own way and that's been good. I want to, uh, uh, as we look and we're starting a, a new section of where we're going to look at a study in Ephesians uh, for two or three Sundays. And um, we're looking at an extremely important passage in second uh, Ephesians where it starts off and it says, you were dead in, in your trespasses to your sins. And so I thought I might just, as I was preparing for the sermon, I thought I might look up and say, you know, it, it, it's a stupid question, but I, I, I'm, I'm good at asking stupid questions. What does it mean to be dead? Well, and we define it. And, and, and so um, I Googled it, of course, you know, that's the ultimate authority in our world is Googling things. And so I Googled it and I thought about, you know, and, and time and time again, and I came across, we define death in terms of life. Don't you? Being dead is not having life. Being dead is, is to, to live, you have to breathe air in and out, right? So being dead, you don't breathe air in and out. And, and uh, to, to be dead, you don't move around and you don't uh, interact. And some of you may think that the quarantine is, is almost as bad as death, but it's really not. And so I did some, some deals, and, and, and if you're a big CSI buff, or you're, uh, you know, like all those detective shows and all that, and, and all, um, I had a friend who used to work for the, uh, the um, crime scene investigation here at OPD, and, and uh, so I looked this up. There are four, four kind of characteristics of death that they use to determine your range of when you die. Okay, this is just freebie information I'm throwing out. Okay, it's uh, there's there's paler mortis, and that if I'm pronouncing that right, paler mortis, and that's because the blood's not pumping to you, the tissues take on a pale because they're not getting the blood flow through, take on a pale gray look. Okay, and so they become, uh, and and that happens a, a shortly after you die, and so you if you've ever seen. Uh, a dead body, you, you notice that. And then there's there's algor mortis. Everything's a mortis on this. Algor mortis, and that's a drop in the body temperature. Okay? Um, and uh, I, I can still remember being traumatized or, or, or the, the, the first funeral I went to as a kid and, and uh, of one of my relatives, and, and my mom made me uh, touch the body. You know, it used to be they'd have the open casket and you'd touch the hands to say goodbye, you know what I mean? And it was cold, okay? It was cold, and that's that's due to this. And then there's my favorite, rigor mortis. We all know rigor mortis, don't we, right? Where, where, where you get all stiff after death, right? But you don't, well, initially after death, you relax. And all your muscles loosen up. And then they tighten up into rigor mortis, and then they loosen up again. Just throw that out. And then you have liver mortis, and that's where the, 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 the blood pools in your body and leaves imprints and co colors, you know, and you have a red part if you're laying down, in the, the, you know. These are all things that they determine. So as I was looking at this passage, what does that have to do with anything? Well, as I was looking at this passage, it says, and you were dead in your trespasses. You and I, before we came to know Jesus Christ, were dead in our trespasses. But what does that mean to be dead in our trespasses? It means we weren't living. It means that, that our, our, our life, our condition was not what God had designed and created us to be. And so Paul is talking to the Ephesians and he's saying, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air. And so it was, it was not unusual to be pale, Skin to, to have that gray skin due to living in the condition of sin. It was not unusual to have a temperature that was kind of cold for them. 
It's not unusual for them to be rigid. See, I'm making this illustration that in our world, we have people that are dead to sin and they're cold to other people, aren't they? And they're set in their ways and they're almost mean to other people. And they, they are not living life to its fullest. So maybe my illustration is breaking down a little bit. But I think you can get the case that to know life, you have to know what death was. And if all you have ever known is death, then you don't know what you're missing. I asked uh, one of the kids one, one time about, um, I used to keep tropical fish and one of the kids, I said, yeah, how, do, how does a fish know he's swimming in water? You know, they, they, I mean, how do they, what, what do they drink when they're thirsty? Do you ever think about that? What do they breathe in, you know? The water. How do you know when you, when you need air? Because it's just all the way around. We are so used to it. Well, I wear a mask and then I know I need air. Okay. Well, you do. It, 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 when something constricts it or keeps the flow of air, we know that we're not getting it. But to be dead in our trespasses, to be dead and not to know it, is, is what Paul is saying. He's saying your normal life, you were dead spiritually. You were dead spiritually and you didn't know it until Jesus came and he paid the price on the cross for our sins. And it wasn't until they, they heard this and they accepted this that they became alive. Um, and he goes like, the, and he says, um, like the rest of mankind, you were dead in your trespasses. How do you know you're dead? Well, you exhibit evidence just as, as a body will exhibit those four evidences of it being dead. When you are dead to sin, you uh, exhibit evidences of death, a callous nature. Maybe, uh, maybe you might, you can be moral or animal. A, a, um, a, a no hope, uh, uh, no idea of, 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 of anything other than yourself. If you, if you don't think our world has progressed much, I don't think our world has progressed much beyond me, the me syndrome. Okay, we we and, and it doesn't surprise me because the world is selfish, isn't it? It's all about living for ourselves, and ultimately, all it's all about power, and it's all about those sort of things. It's not until we start trying to live a life different than mankind that we start experiencing these sort of things. And I think that's the light that Christ shines in the world. So we give evidence, multiple times we give evidence to the fact that we are, 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 are used to living in sin. It doesn't bother us to steal. It doesn't bother us to lie. It doesn't bother us to break the law. It doesn't bother us to do these sort of things. We have no sense of, of anything different than that. That's just always the way it has been. And so that is the walking, and he uses this term, in which you once walked. We all, depending on when we came to know the Lord, all walked in a life of sin that was characterized by sin. Now that we have become and accepted Christ, hopefully we are walking in a life, uh, in a way that characterizes Christ. So we once walked in sin. Not only that, we were once in bondage to sin. Okay, we want, um, it's still that way. The, our world is in bondage to sin right now. The world and, and sin still works on you. It still works on me. The world still, I still want to do things that, that just benefit me. I still want to do things that, that the world says are okay as long as I'm not hurting anybody. I still want to do those things. The world and the sin nature is still in work in me. But here is, there's a word here in verse 4. It says, but. That's my favorite word in the Bible. But. But. You were lost in sin, but. And, and, and what does it say? It says, but God. That's my favorite two words. But God. You were lost in sin. But God, the world mistreats you, but God loves you. The world uh, is giving you uh, problems and you have things, but God desires the best for you. The world hates you, but God loves you. The world 
will not sacrifice itself for you, but God sacrificed himself for you. But God is the greatest two words in the Bible. But, and it says, Paul says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Even when we were rigor mortis, even when we were stiff in our old sin habit, even when we were so steeped in our walk that we didn't know any different, God loved us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him shall have everlasting life. See, but God is in our corner. But God, you know, this pandemic, all of this COVID stuff, this is horrible. I don't like it, but God will bring us through. There's a but God in this. We just don't know it yet. There's a but God. But God is our turning point. See, it's in God's nature. It says... And we we have he gives us a glimpse of God God's nature. He says, "Being rich in mercy." Go on Facebook for a while and see how many people you find rich in mercy these days with their comments. Rich in love and grace. Turn on the news and listen to the po political scene. Are we rich in mercy for one another? Are we rich in mercy for somebody who doesn't line up with our way of thinking? Are we rich in mercy? See, because scripture tells us that because we were dead in our trespasses, we were at odds with God. Let me put that to you another way. Jesus said, love your enemies. Why did he say that? Because that's what God did here. See, we were at odds with God. We were enemies of God. Did you ever think about that? We were enemies with God, and yet God loved us anyway. God loved us anyway. See, that would be the solution to racism in our world, wouldn't it? Instead of hating those that are different, you love them even when they're not loving towards you. See, that's the love and grace and mercy of God. And he says, rich in mercy, great in love. Even as followers, we were not what we once were. And I'm so glad that God is rich in grace and mercy. Why? Because then he can, he can, he can give it out freely. You know what I mean? I, um, I always liked to visit my friends when they were uh, right after, you know, when I was growing up, right after their mom had made, had made cookies. And all that. Why? Because they were rich in good goodies. Okay? What, what happens when you have a lot? You share it, right? You don't go hoarding the toilet paper. You share it. You are rich. When you are rich in it, you share it. Supposedly. If you're like God, if you take on the very Christ-likeness of God, what you are rich in, what God has blessed you with, is the very thing that he wants you to share with the world. It's the very thing that he's lavished upon you. He has lavished his love. He has lavished his grace. Therefore, we are to lavish it upon those who are undeserving and those that are out there and, and those that don't know Christ. See, this is, this is the great tension, the duality in our life. We were once dead spiritually in sin but we are now alive in Christ our bodies that were once dead in sin still live in a world of sin we still have those sin inclinations we still have those things and yet our spirit which is alive in Christ is at war within us We were once dead, we are now alive. It says in here that it says that Christ raised us with himself. See, the very image of baptism, the very image of what Christ did. Why, why do we make such a big deal about the empty tomb? And we say Christ conquered death, and he did. But he conquered more than just physical death. He conquered spiritual death.
See, we were spiritually dead. Now we are spiritually alive because of what Christ has done for us and what God has given to us. See, that's how salvation works. It's not what we can do, but it's what Christ can do for us. By grace, he saved us. He raised us up out of the grave of sin and death. This is a great gift of God. It's undeserved. It's unearned. Um, often, it's unappreciated. Verse 10 closes, and this is a great passage. I could spend a lot, a lot of time on it, but I'm trying just to give you three points. Remember, the first point was you were dead in, trans in your transgressions. Second point, there's a but God in your life. There's a turning point in your life. And if you have not had that turning point in your life, and you have maybe maybe you're uh, someone who's listening to this on Facebook or on YouTube or on our website, and you haven't had that point when you've accepted what Christ has done on the cross for yourself, and you've and you and you maybe you haven't accepted or repented, you haven't realized that you were dead in sin, you haven't realized that you need a savior, and it's when when you realize that there's a but God waiting to happen in your life. And you want to accept Christ. I encourage you to contact me. Okay. Uh, through uh, uh, my contacts there on, on our website. Which is uh, bccodessa.org. And uh, I would love to talk to you. But hopefully. I'm, I think most of us have had a but God time. A but God time. Have you had a but God time in your life? A turning point in your life where you turn, where you were walking in sin and you turned because of what God had done and you walked with him. Not only do I have my main turning point, I have but God times every single time, every day. You know, when the world tells me I'm not worth anything, but God tells me I am worth all. See, these are the things that, that keep me going. And then at the end, he kind of points out at the end, he says in, in verse 10, this is, this is point number three for this as I, as I wrap this up. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. We are, or what he has done is what he has prepared. Many times you ask somebody, what? Tell me about yourself. Immediately, what do they start doing? They start telling you what they do for a living. What, what is their work? Okay. That's, that's what they take pride in. That's what they do. And, and, and that helps define them. If you've ever known anybody who, um, who like to work with wood. Um, I know, I know a gentleman who, who turns, he takes wood chunks. He's always hunting for these weird wood and he turns them and makes them into bowls and ladder these and that's his workmanship, and he's very proud of that, and he's always posting pictures on Facebook. Judy does a lot of artistic, creative stuff, and she's proud of that, and she posts pictures on it. Not me, I just, I post what I eat for lunch or what, you know. I'm like, but your workmanship, what are you proud of? What have you worked? What have you created with your hands? And I've always, as, um, as we do work around, around the church, and as things have happened, I've always wanted to come look and see what we're doing. Don't, aren't you like that? Come look at what I'm doing in the yard. Look at my garden. Look at this. We like to show off our workmanship, don't we? We like to show it off. We like to, to hey, look at, look at my kids. Aren't they turning out great? These are my kids. I, I, think, of, I think of Delaney, and you're probably watching this. I'm like, and, and with, with Claire Bow, you're a little bit, and you're like, look, I made that. I helped make that, right? There's a, that's part, that's a workmanship created. And God's the same way. God's the same way. Just as God bragged about Job in the Old Testament of how faithful he was, God is bragging about you as his workmanship today. Do you ever think about that? That God is bragging on you? And yet a lot of times we can't even take and find voice enough to brag about God to one another or to tell anybody what God is doing in our life. And yet God, why he's, he, we are his workmanship. And why? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are created for good works, not bad works. See, living a life in death and trans 
in the world transgressions it is easy with the with the the signs that we're dead to produce bad works in our spiritual rigor mortis it's easy because we are un, uh, dead to produce bad works but we who are saved and following Christ we are to produce good works and what are good works any idea somebody give me a good work oh no it's one of those interactive sermons I knew you were going to do. Uh, sorry I got my mask I'm hiding behind it see that uh, give me a good work give me a good work somebody pray huh pray pray Okay, you know that is one of the things about the mask. I can't hear, you know, when you're deaf and you, you know. But praying, praying is a work. It's a good work. Praying for others. Now, now, not praying always for our own, our own stuff. Like, you know, when I was a teenager and I wanted that ten speed bicycle I told you about. How that was all I prayed about. I wanted that ten speed bicycle. That's not necessarily a good work. But praying for others, putting others up. Okay, what else? What is is good work that we can do as followers of Christ? Giving. giving we can give we give not just financially which reminds me our offering plates are there on the way out just you know, haha but they are anyway but it's not just we tend to think just financial but we're talking about giving of time you know one of the most important things I think sometimes we as Christians can do to, for one another the, the biggest gift we can give is the gift of listening the gift of listening the gift of reaching out. Yeah, we live in where we're supposed to be social distance and I can't necessarily touch you, but I can talk to you and I can let you know that I'm praying for you and, I can, and I'm concerned for you without ever necessarily even physically touching you. But I can touch you spiritually. I can say I care. That is a good work. We are created, and, and, and this passage says, that should be our natural tense. When, when you are dead in transgression, your natural style is to do what the world does, sin. Look out for number one, put others down, be successful, do all this stuff that the world does without thinking anything about it. But to be alive in Christ, created for good works in his image, we are to seek to put others first. We are seek to seek to sacrifice. We are to seek to be rich in grace and mercy. We are created for good works. And that last part that I said, that we may walk in them. Walk in the good works of God. No longer walking in the works of the sin of this world. We are created to be different. We are created to be different. The Jewish people in the Old Testament, you study, they were called to be a peculiar people. And I can remember when peculiar was a bad term. I can remember growing, being called a nerd was a bad term, right? Now it's almost become kind of cool, right? Because I guess they realized all the nerds were going to wind up being the employers and they'd be working. But, you know, we are to embrace being different. We are to be, we are to embrace the fact that that what motivates us is different than what motivates the world. And that's the love. We were created to be different. So in our closing key point, this is kind of a short one for today. In our closing key point, as we started our, 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 our look at Ephesians, and the reason why I think this is important also is Ephesus was a very uh, metropolitan type city. It was, it was a very much uh, uh, a place where all the world's ideologies and religions and all of that were, were, were mixing and all that. And so for Paul to address the churches saying, it's okay to be different. You were created to be different. You were created to be good. Bethany Christian Church, it's okay to be different. It's okay to be a small church. It's okay to be a loving church. It's okay to be a church that, that is different than everybody else. Because God has created us to be us. And to be of value because he loves us. You see, just as there is a but God for us individual, a time of a but God, like like Reg, you may not you know, may not be very successful in a lot of things, but God loves you. You know, you're six. Uh, I may not be. I may not. You know, I had that goal of being a millionaire by age thirty. 
never got there. But God loved me anyway, and I am successful in, in what he has called me to do, which is more important. So our key point, the life of goodness that regeneration produces has been prepared for us as believers to do. Even the good which we do has its source in God, who has made it all possible. Praise be to God. So as you go and out of this place and you go to do good, be thankful to God that you have that ability to do that because that is what we are created. We are his workmanship. Be encouraged.